mean when we say young Eunice up today and forever. All right, I want to tell you um, a little bit about Dr. Yuna so you can see where you fit in when you say raising young Yunus. Where do I fit in? What do I need to do to be a young Yuna? All right. Um, we thank God we've already had a whole lot of um, scriptures. So if I'm not going to mention scriptures or maybe I'll just refer to a story in the Bible, um, you've already got some scriptures this morning. Thank you, Jesus. So uh, looking at this uh, lady we call Dr. Yuna today, at one time in life, she was where you are. She was a young lady who needed Jesus, and she found Jesus, and her life has never been the same. So uh, we, for the most part, know she's born on January 1st in 1944, and um, she was born in, uh, in Harare, believe it or not. Everybody talks about her coming from Nyanyazi. She was actually born in Harare. Um, it was called, it's old Highfield, but then it was called Highveld. High um, and she then went to live with her grandmother out in, uh, um, in the Chapinga area over there. And she came back home after her grandmother fell sick. And uh, we talked, some of you know the story of how they say she comes from Nyanyadzi, she comes from Nyanyadzi. Uh, what simply happened is her father was an agriculture demonstrator. That was his um, profession. And so he moved from place to place. Wherever there was some agriculture stuff that was going on, he moved from place to place. And he eventually settled in um, the place called Nyanyazi. And um, while he was an agriculture demonstrator, he was also an educator. So he's going from city to city as his job requires and one day he goes there and he eventually settles in, um, in Nyanyazi. She, for herself, did not stay very long in Nyanyazi. It was just a few years because, you know, like I said, she lived with her grandmother um, at one point, And then she also went to, um, to school. And um, so in all that growing up, she was a very interesting um, young lady. She had anger issues. And she says um, she would hit people with sadza. If she was cooking sadza and you came and you provoked her, you were in trouble. Because she would take the pot off the stove, off the fire, and begin chasing after you, throwing out that sadza. Oh, now when you see her, you can tell God did a work in her life, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. And because of her temper, um, her parents would tell uh, whoever was there at the house, whoever was helping them, that our daughter is coming from school, she has a bad temper, just stay out of her way. And you know, when you're told that, everybody wants to try and see how bad is it. And then they would do sorts of thing, all sorts of things to provoke her, and um, you know, she would end up uh, doing all these things. And um, she says her father would punish her because he was trying to discipline her to make sure she grows up to be um, a, a, a wonderful young lady. And so as part of her discipline, he would have her carry stones. You know, in Nyanyazi, it's, it's a very rocky area. There's a lot of stones, rocks around the place. And he would tell her um, if she had done something wrong as part of her punishment, when she came from school, Nyanyazi is a very hot place. Um, and so when I'm talking about Nyanyazi, I'm talking about Zimbabwe, by the way. Yes, he's in Zimbabwe, Ooh, right? And so it would be very hot. And uh, the idea was if she picks up hot stones, surely the message is going to get to her that she needs to get her act together, right? You and I, maybe we just know about being whipped, um, whether it's a whip or, or their hands. That's what most of us know. But her father, because he was trying so hard to discipline her, um, so he would tell her to carry stones. And um, as, as, as time went by, her father was involved in an accident that caused him, um, he, you know, be, he was riding his bike, and um, the accident caused him to go blind. So, the, but the punishment continues. So now he's blind, and she's told she has to carry 50 stones. So she would bring the 50. And if she bought 49, 
and then repeated another stone to make 50, her father knew. And he would say, those are not 50 stones. Um, go back and get some more. She says one time, um, it got so bad that while she was serving this punishment, another one came. And on that day, she had to um, gather like 200 stones. That's how bad it was. She's, and I look at her, and I'm like, thank you, Jesus, for saving her. And then I look at my life, I'm like, oh, Lord, help me. Because if you helped her, there's surely hope for me. All right? Um, and he says, in, uh, she says, in the winter, winter was very cold. Because, you know, hot places like you guys have. Very early in the morning, it's very cold. And that was another way of punishing her. She would carry the stones early in the morning, hoping the message would get across. Lo and behold, it never did. Uh, and then she went to uh, primary school. Her friends over there did not care about studying. All right? So she's a normal kid. She's hanging out with people who study and those who don't study. And she says when she tried to copy her friends, mm -hmm, she tried to copy her friends who were not into school, and then she failed. And she figured, oh, I better get away from these guys. So she changed her way of doing things. And what she then did, this is out in the bushes, you know, she said um, when her friends who were coming from well-to-do families decided they were not interested in school, she realized, I have to go to school because my situation is different. All right? There are some of us who get carried away by people who are coming from homes where their parents give them everything, and we begin to act like them. Meanwhile, we know that where we are coming from, life is very different. You know that everybody is looking up to you right now. So don't be caught up with all those who have everything and couldn't care if they failed or... Because their parents are going to keep paying and keep having them repeat until they... But you know, you know, you know where you're coming from. Um, so she says she then decided the best way to run away was to, to climb up a tree. She would sit up in the tree and do her homework. So when they start looking for her, they can't find her. No one is thinking she's in a tree, so no one is going to be looking up the tree. That was her way of escape so that she could focus on her studies. And eventually, she did very well, and um, she, you know, she went on to do well in, in high school. Um, and after high school, she decided she was going to train as a nurse. She decided she would train as a nurse. And be to show how human she was, um, she says she... She had a boyfriend, which is why she's telling y'all don't have one. Um, she then her when they finished high school, this is with the agreement. The guy would go and um, study to be a teacher, and after he was done, he would work while she was still training as a nurse. And while he's working, he's making enough money so he can marry her. At least they were they were organized. Now you all not doing anything. All you're doing is shacking together, and no one's really making money for anything. All right. Um, so then she goes and she now needs to go to, into nursing school and nursing school at that point they required the nurse to have a certain type of watch they had to have a certain type of watch and because of where she is coming from um, her mother has to empty her savings basically close her bank account to buy her daughter this watch so as she goes to school she is thinking my mother just spent her life savings to buy me this watch to send me to school I better be serious with school so she says um, as she was in school she she really focused on on doing well she decided she was not gonna hang out with people who are not going anywhere she was gonna focus on her studies and make sure that um, she's successful as a nurse in her studies and so she's now in her final year and she has six months to go I'm sure you've heard this part of the story um, she has six months to go before she graduates, and um, <clears throat> there's an Easter ball, all right? So y'all thought balls came when you came? Yeah, they've been there for a while. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's an Easter ball, and so she decides, okay, my boyfriend, I should invite him, because now I'm almost done with school. I'm going to live life a little, and living life a little includes going to this Easter ball with my boyfriend, and after that, we're going to, she, the way she puts it, I was going to give myself over to him. Ooh. Ooh. I believe after this conference, we're not giving ourselves over to anybody until the day they say you are now husband and wife. Yeah, all right? So this is her intention. The Easter ball is on Friday. And um, on the Tuesday, she wakes up 
and there's a notice on the notice board. And the notice is about a tent crusade that they are being invited to. And um, because then nursing was really a big deal, nurses were expected to go to any public place in their uniforms. And so she's in a final year, and she says she has a whole bunch of pins on her, the nursing pins, showing she's in a final year, she's done well, she's done all this, this, that. Um, so she's like, <clears throat> an opportunity to go and show off what I've been doing. And uh, so they plan to go on this Tuesday. Um, and while they're going, she has some friends with her. While she says on the way there, there was a bus that came to pick them up. On the way there, all her friends were talking about, they were, how, they were really excited about this crusade. And you know how people are just chatter, chatter, chatter when we're going somewhere. But she sat there and she was very quiet. And in that quietness, the Holy Spirit began to minister to her. And the Holy Spirit says, um, uh, when are you going to finally renounce your sins? And she's thinking, renounce my sins? You know, and um, the Holy Spirit is like, um, I've seen you read the Bible. Because she used to read her Bible. She says one of her favorite stories was uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. She would um, read the Bible. She would cry. And she would wonder why they did that to Jesus. But after reading that, she would just go back and live a normal life like nothing happened. But on this particular day, um, the Holy Spirit says, when are you going to? give that up and renounce your sins and she says um in that conversation with the holy spirit she simply said tonight i will do it so they get to the meeting the preacher preaches and um remember i said if you know when you are saved you will remember you might not remember everything but there's something that you remember she remembers the scripture that was preached that night man and we're talking today she's what yeah hebrews chapter 2 verse 3 um is the scripture that was preached by that evangelist who had come with the tent crusade. And uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. Um, scripture that simply says. How shall we escape. If we neglect so great a salvation. Which at first began to be spoken by the Lord. And was confirmed to us. By those who heard him. And um, the preacher continues to preach. His scripture that he is preaching. And she says the way as he was speaking. It looked like he kept pointing to her. How shall you escape? How shall you escape? I mean, he's talking to the whole crowd. But for some reason, all she saw was this preacher was pointing at her. And when he got done preaching, um, he's calling up people forward to receive Jesus. Uh, she says that there was darkness in the tent. All of a sudden, you're sitting with your friends. Imagine, you're sitting in here. It's not like there's a power cut or anything, no. But because God wants to get your attention, there is darkness in the tent, and the only place that there is light in the tent is where the preacher is standing. And so she realizes she needs to go where this light is. She says, I have no idea how I got over my friends and made it to the front to receive Jesus as her Lord and Savior. So when you see the passion that she has for people to get saved, she has experienced what it is to not have Jesus and then to have Jesus. So she knows that when you don't have Jesus, man, you can really have a bad temper and throw suds at people. But when you have Jesus, you can be so loving and so precious, so kind because of the life that you get from Jesus. Um, so then after she... She received Jesus. She says, it felt so sweet. Something happened in my spirit, and I really felt good. And she goes back to her place where they're, um, the hospital where they train nurse, nurses, and they have the, the, the place where she sleeps. Um, and she, then the Holy Spirit says to her, you have to take care of some business here. Uh, basically like restitution. The Holy Spirit then says to her, she needs to write a letter to her parents and apologize for being such, such a nasty kid, for being such a difficult kid. Because now she has received Jesus, she realizes how bad she was. So she writes a letter to her parents, and then she writes a letter to her grandmother, asking her grandmother to forgive her. Because as she was staying with her grandmother, you know how grandkids are. Your grandmother will tell you to do something, and you just don't do it. She says there were times she would ask me to do something, and I refused to do it. So now the Holy Spirit, years later, reminds her that she needs to apologize. So she writes this letter to her grandmother asking for forgiveness. Um, as if that was not enough, the Holy Spirit says to her, you took a book from the library when you were in school. Hmm. And, you know, in her mind, she's like, well, the way I took the book, I was like, you know, 
my parents are paying fees at the school, so everything in the school belongs to me. Let me just take this book, and it's mine. And she just left the school with the book. She just decided she was going to keep it. Um, and no one asked her, so it's okay, right? At that moment, it's okay. No one has asked you. Um, but then the Holy Spirit reminds her that you stole a book when you were still in high school. Uh, so she then finds that book, and um, she writes a letter to the principal of that school and asks them to read this letter during assembly so that the whole school can hear. And she's telling them that she, you know, she's been saved, she's asking for forgiveness, and she's saying, I stole this book, uh, I'm going to return it because Jesus has changed my life. I'm sure in that assembly, um, something must have happened to somebody while others are laughing, thinking she's really crazy. Um, other people are thinking, wow, how could someone do that, you know? Um, and, oh man, the Holy Spirit can remind you of things that may not be important when you do them, but when you need to take care of business, they become important. And the Holy Spirit told her that there was a time, she used to play netball, so she was also playing sports. There was a time they were going um, to a place to play um, netball, and she got on the bus, and she told the conductor, uh, my money is at our destination. And I think back in that day, it, it was okay. It meant when you get off the bus, you're going to get the money and give the conductor. And um, she got there, got off the bus, never paid. And on the way back, uh, the conductor changed. So in her mind, you know, she's, she's, she's young. She's like, oh, well, this guy doesn't know I didn't pay. It's okay. I'm just going to let it go. And she gets on the bus. She goes back home and does not pay. So the Holy Spirit says to her, you boarded a bus for free. You owe a bus company money. And she says at that point when she had boarded the bus, it was 30 cents. And life was good then. 30 cents for the bus ride. Um, but she decided to send a dollar. And um, the bus company had gone out of business. Now, I know if that was me, I would have said, Oh, well, Holy Spirit, you know, I was going to try, but, you know, the bus company's gone out of business, so they really don't need the money. You can just forgive me and we move on. But because of what had happened in her spirit, she simply wrote the letter and sent it to the, um, the bus company owner. The owner was still there. The business had broken down, but the owner was still there. And she apologized and said, forgive me for going on your bus for free. Here is your money. That's when God does a work in your life. He will show you everything that nobody knows about. You know, many times we worry about what people know. But in this case, these are things that nobody else knew about. But because of the work of the Holy Ghost, that was ish. So she went ahead and, um, and she did that. So when you see her talking about how lives should change when you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, she knows what she has experienced. And she wants everybody to make sure that you receive Jesus as your Savior and that you obey what the Holy Ghost is saying in your life. Right? So after she gets saved, um, her parents are thinking this is a joke. Yuna herself is really saved. Um, that nasty kid is really saved. They're thinking it's going to last for a few days and then she's going to go back to her old self. And lo and behold, it does not end. Up until today, she's been saved from that time. She's been serving Jesus with all her life, everything about her. Um, so she says after that, she's, you know, she's still, um, she finishes her training and she begins to work at, um, at the Harare, Harare Central Hospital. She's working there. And as she's working, part of what she, she does um, is to work with mothers who are nursing their children. She was the one who would be comforting mothers whose babies had died. And um, those kids who were very sick, she was always giving hope to these mothers. You know, In addition to her normal nursing duties, she was, because of the compassion that the God had put in her heart, she was doing this outside of her normal nursing duties. Um, she began to preach. Uh, while she was there, telling people about Jesus. Uh, if God has done a work in your life, you want to tell everybody. If you, if, if you have not experienced true salvation, you have nothing to talk about. But if you've experienced a change in your life, you want everybody to know what Jesus has done in your life. And you want everyone else to, to get an opportunity to experience it. You want everyone um, to 
Yeah, to, to just receive Jesus so that they can be rescued from danger, so that they can be delivered from the, uh, from the miserable life that they are living in, the life of um, hard work with no results. But when you receive Jesus, your life begins to change. Um, so she was going ahead and she's preaching. On Sundays, she asked for permission to preach in the hospital. She was on fire. She was on fire. Remember, she is just Yuna Sitole, who is just minding her own business. But she's already on fire. She asked um, for permission at the hospital to preach every Sunday night at 6 p.m. for 30 minutes, preaching to the people, you know, the patients in the hospital. That those were her, 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 her church members, if I can say that. She would preach to them. And obviously, in that preaching, she's praying for them, for people to get healed. She's praying for them, for people to receive Jesus. And um, she says Sunday mornings, she would take whatever kids that were in hospital, she would gather them up and have children's church with them. You know, some of us call it Sunday school. So all these things that we see her do, she had done before. It's not when she became Mrs. Goody, she's like, oh, now what do I do? How, where do I start? What do I, no, it was already in her. So when you're saying raising exceptional young Yunas, what are you saying? Hmm? Are we waiting to become Mrs. Guti so we can then begin to do what we are supposed to do? She's already serving God. At this time, she's serving God. She's not in any leadership position. She's just a child of God. When she got saved, um, her friend then told her that there was a church. Um, and eventually, she ends up going to, to Zayoja. And when she, she goes to, to Zayoja, she... She begins to participate in church. She begins to participate in the youth ministry. She's participating when they need someone to teach in the children's ministry, Sunday school. She's there. She's teaching. When it's time for prayer, she's there. She's praying. When it's time to go minister at the pastor's house, she's there. She's ministering at the pastor's house. She was doing everything that she could to serve God with everything in her. She was even praying that God bless me so that I can give my money to do your work. And you know, when you read the, the history book, we're told about a, um, a young lady by the name Yuna Sitole who sponsored the, the birth of the church in Bulawayo in Zimbabwe. She gave her money for a pastor to be sent to start preaching in that area. The same way someone gave money for, pre, um, for pastors to come over here and preach the word of God, she did that. And she did not do it one time. When you read the history book, it tells you that she supported the pastor in Bulawayo all the way until the day she quit her job. So for all the years that she was working, every month, she did not skip a month and say, well, this month I've got to save my money and do what I want. Hey, church people, do whatever you need to do. I've already helped you. The church is already in your place. But she supported the gospel. She supported the pastor for all the time that um, she was still working. When she quit her job and now she's married, she's Mrs. Goody, unfortunately, she had no money that she was receiving. And that's when it stopped supporting but she did not sit there and say, well, I'm here now. I don't have anything to do. She began to sell. You know, when she talks about talent, she's talking about selling. tells you how she started. She would sell potatoes at church on a Sunday. She'd cook potatoes. And, I, 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 you know, I keep imagining how was she serving them, but people were buying them. Um, after church, everyone is hungry. Back then, they had two services, by the way. We had a morning service, then we would take a lunch break. And every, it was like a picnic when we look back now. At lunchtime, everybody, you know, everybody goes, spreads out some, um, some cloth, and people sit there, they take out their bags, and people begin to eat their lunch. And we're done, we pack up our stuff, fold up our things, and go back into church at 2 o'clock and have service again. So, yeah, there was room for people to buy potato, because, you know, people really sat down and ate. No, there was no hurry. They wanted to be back in service, but they needed to eat, take care of themselves, all right? So um, as she began to, to then be able to um, make money as she's selling, she's able to participate in whatever is going on in church and give to the Lord. Um, so before she gets married, I think that's what we're more interested in, right? Before she gets married, she's, um, wherever she was working, she worked in her hospital, she worked at Morganster um, Hospital, and she says, because of the fire of God that was in her, she made such an impact in that place. 
um, so much that when she left, it was hard to erase her, her, her name in that place. Whoever came in, no one could match up to what she had done. She says in one place, she worked with such um, a very strict, maybe you want to call him difficult uh, medical doctor. He was a senior doctor there. And um, his office was a mess. And everybody kept telling her, don't ever touch anything in his office. Because if you move anything, you're going to be in trouble. And she says, I walked in there for a few days. You want to do what everybody's telling you. Just leave him alone. But then she says, the place looked filthy. It needed to be cleaned up. And so the Holy Ghost, you know, I mean, if you earn a job, you can just say, this is nothing to do with me. After I'm a nurse, I'm not supposed to be able to clean up anything. I'm just a nurse, all right? But because she wanted to be a good kid, she wanted to serve God in whatever ways she could. She went in there, and she says, the Holy Spirit just told her, you pick up. So she took in a friend, and she would pick up the thing, and they wipe and put right back where it was. Pick up this, wipe the table, put it right back where it was. That's going to take some love. Because I know, I'll be thinking, he wants to live in his mess. Let him live in his mess. I'm just here to do my job. And when the time comes, I'm going to be promoted and move elsewhere or whatever it is. But she wanted to serve God regardless of who it was. So she cleaned up everything. And she says she went into some section where there was like an old medicine, stuff that was years old that just needed to be thrown out. She cleaned up the place. The guy came and he was surprised. Because his stuff is exactly as it has always been. But it's clean. And, um, you know, after that, obviously, she becomes the best. She becomes the darling. And everybody wants to be like her. Um, while she's there, are you guys still with me? All right. So while she's um, working there as a nurse, she's, I told you she's preaching. And um, she gets in trouble because she's preaching to junior nurses. And the hospital doesn't like that. You know, the hospital staff, they, they're telling her no. So she's banned from going to the junior nurses' homes. She can only meet with them at tea time, out in the public. She's not allowed to go into their rooms because she is preaching Jesus. All right? She's preaching Jesus. By the way, when she got saved and she eventually started coming to church, her, her family disowned her. They're like, we don't like you. You want, would you going to what kind of church? Forget this. This is the end of it. We don't want to hear anything about you. Um, she says she remembers leaving that day. Um, no one took her to the bus. That's how bad it was. Nobody took her to the bus. She says, my mom, obviously, as a mother, you always want the best for your child, and you have to obey what father is saying. So she simply gave her um, a lamp that she was supposed to use because the bus was like 3 o'clock in the morning. She gave her the lamp. Normally, people would escort you with the lamp and come back, but now she doesn't want to get in trouble. But she doesn't want her daughter getting lost either. So she gives her a lamp, and she says, when you get um, to the bus stop, leave the lamp by the stores, and I'll pick it up in the morning. A mother's love. A mother's love. You know, she could have joined up with her husband and said, Yeah, right. Go, go. We don't want anything to do with you. But because of the love. And she obviously does not forget that. With the love that her mother has shown her, she wants to be able to show love to everyone. And I'm sure for those of you who have met her, when you're with her, you would think she's known you all her, her life. And um, everything is about you right now. She doesn't think of anyone else afterwards. It's the love that she learned to show. Um, then we, we're told that she, they would be given money. I just thought, I need you to see her real life before you see what you see today. Yeah? Am I helping someone? All right. Um, and as nurses, she says, um, I think it was during Christmas time. They were, I don't know if it was Christmas time or some function was going on. They were given money and they were all told they had to go buy uh, bathing suits, swimming costumes. Because they're all going to be swimming. So everybody is ready to go and buy their swimming costumes so they can swim um, whatever function it was that was there. And she said, I decided I want to buy presents for patients in the hospital. Huh? <laughs> An opportunity to go swimming and you've been given the money to buy what you need to be able to swim. And she says that she decided to use her money to buy bananas for the patients. So she just went and told her seniors that, thank you very much for the money. I'm not buying a bathing suit. I am going to buy bananas for the patients. And obviously, they all thought she was crazy. Um, but at that point, I think you've decided she's crazy. Let's just let her do what she does. Um, she goes, she's at church. She's a Sunday school teacher. She's a youth chairman. She's a choir master. And she belongs to a prayer band. All this before she even knew she was going to marry anyone. 
Oh, by the way, that story about the guy. Yes, so when she got saved, she also wrote a letter to the guy and said, forget it. Forget it. Forget it. We're done. She had prepared. I forgot to tell you. She had been practicing for the dance. She bought a dress and she'd been practicing for the dance. But when Jesus comes and he turns your life around, it doesn't matter how much money you had spent, how much preparation had gone into it. She quit the whole thing. You know, there's some of us who are like, yeah, I received Jesus, but you know what? I'd already paid to go to this show, so I'm just going to go. Uh, and at that show, you backslide. All right. Um, and because she loved to pray so much, um, but then she's, she's met Baba, who is uh, the pastor of the church, and she sees how much he loves to do the work of God with his whole heart, and she just continues to serve because that's her thing. She's serving. And it says, um, she says one day there was a prayer meeting that Baba was doing with the boys, um, some of the, the, the boys then are, are now bishops in the church and some of them have actually gone home to be with the Lord. And she says, he would pray with um, the ladies, but it was very rare. Baba spent more time praying with the, uh, with the men than he did. But because she was a different woman, she was a different lady. She wanted to be where the action was. She wanted to be where people were learning to do something. And then, you know, she says, we were praying, um, but she wanted to be where the leader of the church is praying. She had seen that obviously there is something in this man, all these people that are following him. So she wanted to be in those kind of prayer meetings where all the guys would be. She was not going to be seen by the guys. She was not going to be a show, but she just wanted to participate in the prayer meetings. And she says, uh, obviously, she was not allowed. But on one day, she took a risk. She put on some white overalls. And she put on a hat. And went to this prayer meeting early before most of the people were there. And she got into a corner. So as people come in, I mean, if you're wearing a white, wearing white overall and it's a men's place, no one is going to think, who is this? They just think someone has come early and they're praying, right? So she says, they were praying and praying. Then Baba was teaching. Um, and then they were praying and praying and praying. And it got to a point where, man, when there's fire in the place, you can't keep whispering and say, Jesus, I love you. You have to then tell Jesus, woo! All right? <laughs> so in that, that's when they discovered we have a girl in this place. Because, you know, of, this, uh, of the noise she then made, because she was um, uh, on fire as they were praying in that place. All right? So she has loved to pray from day one. Even today, we all know, if you ask all these pastors here, they'll tell you, if you go into a prayer meeting with Dr. Yuna, you better have shut down your house because you don't know when you're coming back. And, uh, you know, some of the bishops uh, tell us this, that she was like that even then in these prayer meetings when they were praying. They had a prayer band, you know, where it was a bunch of youth that would pray together. And they said that when you started praying with Yuna, you were not going to stop until God spoke. And so because, you know, because people are human, some began to lie and say, the Lord is saying this. And she picked it up and she's like, uh-uh. So in the end, if you wanted to leave, you just picked up your bags and left. She was not shutting down prayer. And even today, I am telling you, I have known her all my life. And a prayer meeting with her, I better have my life together. I better not be cooking dinner because it's going to burn. I better not have told someone, wait for me, I'm coming. Because they'll be waiting until, you know, kingdom come. All right? So when she says, let's pray, she means business. She will pray. When you go to pastor's prayer meetings, um, you know, there's some people who come into a prayer meeting and they want to greet people. She's serious about her prayer. You will not greet her. But some of us, we kneel down and then we look around and we can say, yeah. She does not do that. So much that even if you want to ask her, if she has anything she would like to teach, you have to make a prayer. Do I, do I go and disturb her? And, you know, you know God is gracious, though. Because sometimes you just go and you stand by her, and she can tell these people who are trying to get my attention, and then she'll lift up her head. But she's not like you and I, who every time someone walks in and we're in prayer, we're looking up to see who was it. No, she is serious about her prayer life. And she has been serious from day one. And when we see what God is doing in her life, it's not because she is... Am I guilty? No. It's because of the foundation that has, she has laid in her own life. What is happening today? She's simply walking on what had, God had already ordained for her. But he prepared her before the time came. 
She was reading the word of God. She can read the Bible until you all think my eyes can't read anymore. She can pray until you all think you fall asleep. You know, I mean, I've been in prayer meetings where I've actually just, like, oof, I'm done. And I just fall asleep and I'm like, wake me up when we're done. Because I'm tired. But she will not stop. Even if you go to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, if she's supposed to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, she will get up at 3. While you and I are going to say, Holy Ghost, you know we didn't sleep today. So you know what? For today, we will not talk to you. We'll talk to you now with dreams. Yes, when it says watch and pray, we'll be watching our eyelids. All right? Um, because we are tired. But she will be, anytime you say this prayer, you know, she, we, you, you've heard that she, she's in school. And um, then while, she, while her classes were going on, some uh, districts were doing their prayer retreats. The women were having prayer retreats. And... Um, some provinces were also having prayer retreats. So anyway, she then thinks, I need to go and pray. But she has to be in class. And she has to be doing her assignments. Um, but, you know, um, her kind of life is not like, you know, yours when school is done, you come home. If you're going to your work, you go to work. When you come home, you're done. No one else is bothering you. Her life is not like that. Every minute of her life, somebody wants something from her. So we try to tell her, Mom, you know what, this is... Um, you need to just focus on school for now. You can do your church work later. Right now, just, just, just do school for now, okay? Just do school. And um, then she looks at us and she says, you are crazy. I am showing up in these prayer meetings. And she is definitely going to these prayer meetings. She's there all night. And the next morning, she showers and she's back in class. And I'm just like, kudos to you, you know, kudos to you. I could not do that for a week and still survive. But because she loves to be in prayer, she will be in prayer any time. And when God gives her the grace, she gets to class, she's wide awake, and she, can, she comes home and she's singing what they were talking about. And we're like, man, we don't even pay attention like that in class. All right? Um, but she's a very determined woman. She's been determined from then and even up until today. Whatever she does, she has aggressive faith. Aggressive faith. She will not take no for an answer. Some of us, we pray a little bit, and then we're like, oh, you know what? I think God said no. She will not take no for an answer. And a great example is um, what happens when um, Ezekiel Jr. is born. The guy is, uh, is born dead. And, you know, hey, look. Any other woman would have said, okay, Lord, let's just pray that he's alive. Let's just, and then, then they say, no, sorry, we, we, we can't resuscitate. Sorry, too bad. Let's just leave it. Some people would have just walked away and said that was it. But because she will not take no for an answer. She said, that's not the end of it. This is where it all begins. And prayer and prayer and prayer and prayer. And we know the story. She eventually goes home with her son. Um, out of This all comes as a result of prayer. She does not take no for an answer. While she's young, she built a house for her parents. Oh, y'all. Mm -hmm. While you're making your money, we were told yesterday about the blessing of giving to our parents. When God blesses you, go ahead. Make it, a, make it one of your to-do lists that before I get married, I should build my parents a home. I should buy my parents this. I should do this. So she builds her parents a home. She builds a store. Like, um, so they actually used to have a business. Who, right? That was built by Yuna as she is um, working and taking care of um, her parents. Right. The day comes that she, now God has decided that it's time for her to get married. She was not young, by the way. Um, all her kids got married way before she got married. And I think all her kids, by the time we were mom's age that she got married, and I think we all had like two or three kids by then. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, she, at, once she gets saved, she's ditched her guy. She gets saved, and she decides, I want to serve God. I am not worried about this whole thing about getting married. Because she says she saw her friends who were getting married, who were on fire. The day they become Mrs. So-and-so, the fire dies. And she's like, man, if life is all about dying, um, if the fire dies just because I got married, let's ditch marriage and just serve God. So in her desire, she wants to just serve God, serve God, serve God, serve God. And you're all wondering, how old was she when she got married? Uh, um, right, I think we heard about it. She was, um, she was 29 going on to 30, all right? So she gets married. Um, but the whole story, how it happens is... The word comes, she prays, she'd been praying, and the Holy Spirit confirms her. I don't have time to go into all that now. And the Holy Spirit simply confirms to her that you said you want to serve me. You said you do anything I ask you to do. This is what I'm asking you to do, to marry this man who already has this church, a whole bunch of members, a whole bunch of uh, men and women that are in this church, and all they need now is a mother to come 
into this church. And uh, why was she chosen? Because she was already serving God on her own. That was part of the criteria for who could become. Hey, who could become my guti? It was not the pretty ladies who were just coming in and, and sitting in church and just smiling and making sure everybody knows what they're wearing and how, look, how wonderful they look. No, it was people who were already serving the Lord on their own. They were not looking for people that were going to have to now crank up and say, Oh, by the way, you know, Mama Pastor, you better get up and pray. She was already praying. She was already preaching. She was already serving people. She was already taking care of orphans, taking care of the needy, taking care of whoever needed her help. She was there to help them. So as she became a mother, you know, God had already prepared her to be a mother of nations. It's not something she learned now that she's on the job. Because if someone is learning something on the job, you can tell the day they forget. And they're like, oh, wait, I forgot. What did they tell me in class again? No, because it was already a part of her that many people would come. She says many people would come to the house. Some people come. Some people take their blankets when they're leaving. Some people come. You know, some people visit the pastor's house with food. Some people come to eat the pastor's house. I mean, eat food at the pastor's house. But all that did not bother her because all she wanted was to be a blessing to the people of God. To be a blessing to the people of God. So, um, and she continues, she continues to serve God. And because of her faithfulness, let me just fast forward so we can close this up. Because of her faithfulness in serving God and seeking God, she became an evangelist when she turned 60. All right? So when I look at her, I'm like, oh, this is for us all, right? But I'm like, Lord, don't wait for me to get to 60, please. All right? But, you know, that is just... Um, a testimony for us to see how God can reward you in his time. She became a powerful evangelist. I mean, she'd already been preaching. Things had been happening. But where she is now out there preaching in stadiums, packed up with people, miracles happening left, right, and center. She is not laying hands on anyone. She is simply speaking the word, and God begins to do wonders in her life. Um, and then some of you have heard about the explo that happened different cities, different nations, filling up stadiums. And um, what was happening is, th because there was so much power that God had put on her life that is now being manifested, it came out from a lot of time of prayer and reading the word of God. You want to go somewhere in life, get into the word, get into prayer. When you are ready, God is going to release you, and you can go and do extraordinary things. You can do exceptional things. Um, and you know, as the meetings were going on, even until today, that still happens. When she would come on Saturday night at Explo, I just want to give you an idea. Explo meetings, this is out in the stadium, you've got thousands, 20,000, 30,000 people in the stadium. And um, as her car is driving in for the service, she is not out of the car. It's driving into the gate, just like we're driving into there. The presence of God, demons will start manifesting. There would be chaos in the stadium before she even set foot herself. It's just her car. Hey, what an anointing. Come on, come on, guys. God can do that in your life. You don't have to wait to get married. Right now, right now, I hear her many times. She's saying, I'm looking for some young ladies who want to preach the gospel. Some young ladies who want to serve God. Some young ladies who want to say, I don't want to do anything else but to go and preach the gospel. I am ready to, to, to go wherever God is sending me to go. Hmm. And I'm sure from here, from what she said, that some of you in this place, those who desire it, those who desire it, those who desire it, God is getting ready to do it. At the end of this conference, at the end of this conference, huh? right, 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 I don't want you to say that, but tell yourself, watch this space. Don't tell anybody, watch this space. Because God is about to surprise somebody. God is about to do amazing things. God is about to set someone on fire. God is about, about to give some people gifts. Some people have gifts, but now God is about to give them the energy required to operate in those giftings. God is about to give you the wisdom that you need to be where you need to be. God is about to change your situation. Where when you show up in a place, everybody knows that the solution has come. God is about to surprise some people. And she said, only those who are willing. Only those who are willing. God doesn't work with those who don't want to. 
but those who are willing, those who want to pay the price, those who want to pay the price. How do we pay the price? By obeying the word of God. How do we pay the price? By living a holy life. How do we pay the price? By doing what God expects us to do. <sighs> God is looking for someone in this place this weekend. Since the beginning of the weekend, he's been going through, looking to see who, who, who. And today, he's about to release some people into their destiny. He's about to release some people into their destiny. Just like the daughters of Philip, they were prophetesses. You and I, daughters of Una, the young Unas, God can make us prophetesses. God can make us a prophetess in our age, in our time, in our season. God can give us that same faith that he gave to Una as she was growing up to believe. God was able to do it. He can give us that same faith, that same aggression that she has in seeking the face of God. He can give those who want it. That fire that she has, those who want it, that fire can be released into their lives. When you say we are young units, it's not just a saying. You got to want it. You got to want it. You got to want it. Not to be where she is today, but to be where I need to be as a young Yuna. To be who God has created me to be. To be who God has destined for me to be. Understanding that whatever she has done, she has not done anything outside of the word of God. She has simply obeyed the word of God. Even as we speak, she still continues to obey the word of God. She continues to say, Lord, here I am. She has given up her life to do whatever the Lord wants her to do. She says, Lord, I will go wherever you send me. Even if it means leaving a two-week-old baby, I will go wherever you send me. Even if it means living in a suitcase for six months, nine months of the year, I will go wherever you send me. Even if it means that she cannot sleep in a comfortable bed, I will go wherever you send me. I will go wherever you send me. If I don't get to eat what I want to eat, I will go wherever you send me. I might not wear what I want to wear. I will go wherever you send me. There are some people who are crying out. People who are looking for help. And God says, who is ready? Who is ready? Who is ready? Who wants to be? Who wants to be like you now? Who is going out? Preaching the word of God. Going out. Taking care of people. Going out. Getting people saved through the word of God. Going out. Empowering people to do business. Empowering people to make their own money. Today, if you are there, that spirit can be released into your life. That spirit can be released into your life. That spirit can be released into your life.